good morning everybody on Facebook. Welcome. Uh, great to see you uh, on the IM Community uh, Group. And we're here for day four of uh, our Investor Musician Peak Performance Challenge. Uh, we've covered a lot of stuff in the first three days and we have a lot of stuff to go in the next two days and uh, it's going to be a busy morning but we're going we're gonna to get through it. And uh, Tom Steele from Christchurch, New Zealand. Socks, fosh, fungus, and chops. Um, that must be very early in the morning or very late at night in Christchurch. That is, uh, that is very impressive. We got people all over the world, so that's, uh, it's fantastic. Please let us know where you're coming in from. Uh, and great to see everyone back. Great to see the new people uh, in this morning. Uh, so we're going to get going with this once I learn how to use the slides again. Oops. This has been a learning curve for me too. Okay, there we go. How's that? Perfection. Or close enough to perfection. Um, just so that you know, so we'll be taking questions this morning. If you have questions, please send them to us uh, in the chat in the Zoom room. You could also send questions uh, in the I Am Community uh, Facebook group and Dana will get them to us. Uh, we have a few uh, email questions that came in overnight, which we'll get to as well. Um, a lot of fun stuff to talk about, but we are in the Peak Performance Challenge. This is day four of five uh, and uh, we're excited to, um, to get into it this morning. So this is me, I'm Andrew, uh, I'm Principal Horn of the Los Angeles Philharmonic and uh, uh, was lucky enough to play on John Williams' last three Star Wars films, which was um, pretty cool. Uh, done a bunch of little things around the place. Um, so yeah, so one of, one of the things I really enjoy doing is teaching uh, and I'm, I'm very fortunate to be the, uh, the Horn Professor at the Colburn School. Uh, we are excited to be going back uh, in person teaching uh, at the beginning of next semester which is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but Rupal and I uh, started Investor Musician uh, at the beginning of the pandemic uh, to provide service and, uh, and information to, to our uh, community of horn players and, and other musicians. And uh, we, created, uh, we created a program that, uh, that has run pretty much the entire pandemic. And we're excited to, uh, to share some of our, our uh, knowledge and, uh, and ideas with you guys this morning. Here is our team for our Peak Performance Challenge. Thank you to all of these incredible people for making things work incredibly smoothly, despite my uh, interruptions. And this is just a little bit about Invested Musician. If you haven't checked us out, please have a look at the website, www.investedmusician.com. Uh, there's a lot of interesting resources there, information uh, about uh, playing music, uh, your business side. Uh, our goal, of course, is to help revolutionize your playing, accelerate your career, and build your financial stability as a musician. So please check us out. If you've got any questions, uh, you can contact us through the website. Okay, recap time. So the first three days, we started with our building blocks away from the instrument. And this is a really important thing to keep in mind is that we need to set ourselves up without the horn or without the flute or without the clarinet or whichever instrument we're playing. So that we wanna make sure that we're building our building blocks of breathing and blowing, our setup or our lips and our tongue as simply as possible away from the instrument. So actually, let's start. Why don't, we, why don't we do a breathing exercise just to get going? Fingers. We, people who have been here for three days will know uh, exactly what we're about to do. So focus on our breathing. Really be aware of what the feeling is when we're breathing nice and low and around. And then we're just going to exhale that as freely and openly as we can. So we're really aware of this bellows feeling as we breathe and blow. Really nice and simple. If you've got a straw with you, same thing through the straw. Or 
always trying to replicate that feeling. If you've got a little bit of a thinner straw, you'll feel a little bit more resistance. That's great. It's just going to focus your uh, awareness to, uh, to what's going on in your body. And then we're going to transfer that to the mouthpiece. Always the same feeling. And then we're going to put that into the horn. Or to whatever instrument you're holding. Really, really simple. So by now we're pretty comfortable with this. And this is what I'm doing at the beginning of every day, making sure that I'm setting up my mechanism so that it is simple, natural and repeatable. And everything has to fit into those buckets. If I am not, if my mechanism is not simple, natural and repeatable, or if something that I'm trying to learn is not simple, natural and repeatable, I don't want to know about it. So I've got to make sure everything fits into these categories. This is the way that we're going to be able to perform at a high level when we're under the most amount of stress and pressure. So for an audition, for a concert, if we've got a conductor giving us the, giving us the stinky eyeball, uh, we, can, uh, we can have this really simple, natural and repeatable mechanism that we can go back to and we're going to produce really good results. So let's go through, the, through a few of the fundamentals that we looked at in the first, uh, on the first day. So four and four. So four notes without articulation, just focusing on moving the airstream, and then four notes with the articulation. Very, very simple. We're going to start on a concert F. we like one of the questions that came in uh, on the email last night was about the breathing and blowing and uh, this is this is a really interesting thing for us to to make sure that we that we focus on when we breathe and blow all that we're doing on the exhale is just simply deflating our lungs so what you'll feel is that your stomach is just coming in coming in maybe coming up as you as you are blowing out this is the feeling that we want we don't want to be static in our stomach if you, if you take the mouthpiece out of, out of your instrument and you breathe and then you, what some of us may think as support, so we block here and we, we get tense in our stomach, you feel a lot of tension that goes into your chest and into your throat. And this is not really what we want. We want to make sure that we're, we're keeping things as simple as possible. So you're just going to feel your stomach going in, very natural as if you were like bellows and a very, very simple process. So... And this is the same feeling that we want to make sure that we put in when we are uh, when we're playing these simple long notes, so that we're focusing on just moving that airstream as basically and simply as we can. So I can really feel this engagement and this feeling as if I'm as if I've got a soaking wet towel and I'm just turning that towel. Nice and gently, there's activity and the water is just flowing out. That's what I want that feeling when when I'm blowing out of the uh, out of my face and into the horn. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So now the next step, of course, is with then we're going to extend this one a little bit. So we're going to do a repeated note pattern. So exactly the same feeling with the airstream, this constant movement of the air, and we're just going to be cutting it at different intervals. So we're going to go down a half step to uh, concert E. engaging with the airstream having that flow out as if we're 
squeezing the orange or twisting the towel uh, full of water. Our next tip is we're going to start moving notes. So we're going to start moving through the range. One that we call uh, slow scales. Very, very simple idea. <laughs> And remember, if you have any trouble with any of these, uh, I would always go back to the mouthpiece, or always go back to my fingers to reset what I'm doing and to remind myself, this is the feeling that I want to put into the horn. This is the feeling that I want to make sure I replicate when I'm under pressure, under stress. The next time we looked at was uh, repeated note scales. Uh, let's go up a half step. So once we've got, we're feeling comfortable with that, we can increase the repetition, increase the difficulty. So I would go up a half step and play it with triplets. And then sixteenth uh, notes. Excellent. So, so the idea is to make sure that the air stays constant. I'm constantly engaged and active with my airstream, and the tongue is just cutting that air and coordinating with my uh, with my change of the notes of my fingers. And the last one we looked at was stamp. So this is a little bit softer one we talked about. So everything we've done to this point has been pretty loud because we're just focusing on moving the air. With the stamp, we can start dialing it down. We want the same feeling, but with a little less activity in the airstream, a little less air getting through the horn, and we're just focusing on connecting through the notes through the range. <laughs> Obviously, with that one, we can move up and down through the range as we need. One of the questions that we got overnight was about the four and four exercise. With four by four, I tend to go down. I don't like doing a lot of static stuff as I go up into the upper register. It makes me feel stiff and, and tired. The idea, and, and it also diverts my attention from moving the air and to making sure that I'm you know, getting, getting notes out. So I like to play these the static ones down lower. If I'm extending things in the range and going higher, I want to be doing moving, more moving exercises, something with more motion. So there's something to experiment. So along with, uh, along with the simple, natural and repeatable that we talked about uh, on the first couple of days, What's really important is that we focus on our practice session being experimentation sessions. So we get to discover things and we get to try things out, remembering that the only person that's hearing us practice is us. So if we make mistakes, it's just an opportunity for us to learn something. And that's what we want to be doing. Okay. So expanding the skills with exercises. So we've done some basic exercises and we're applying these skills. From here, we can actually really start extending what we're doing in terms of difficulty, but we need to make sure that we're doing it in a way that we're aware of what we're doing. We're always trying to make sure that we're building awareness of, of implementing the things that we want in our system. If we can't be aware of how we're breathing, how we're blowing, where your tongue is, uh, making sure that your, your chops are nice and set and forward, if we can't be aware of those things, we run the danger of embedding poor habits. And what we want to be doing is implementing really good habits and reinforcing those habits. So even when I'm doing an exercise, um, so I'm doing an exercise like that that's covering the whole range and is quite fast. I still want to be able to focus on how am I moving my air? Am I moving my air faster as I'm going higher? Or am I really just shoving the mouthpiece into my face and tensing up? I want to make sure that the air is doing the work. 
getting me into the upper register and opening up that airstream into the lower register. And as I change to articulation, the articulation is a very small, simple movement and it's, uh, it's as uh, consistent as I can possibly make it. So the next step that we talked about is applying these things to studies. And this is how we're going to develop progress in a sustainable way, both musically and technically. So the first three areas that we talked about were articulation, rhythm and tempo that we can change when we play simple studies. And then we can gradually increase the difficulty of the study. We can also increase the difficulty of the elements that we're changing uh, in our exercises and studies. So your overnight assignment was practice a simple study, blowing first, and then play without articulation, and then playing it as written. So a good one for that that we did was uh, cop brush number 10. <laughs> articulation we play it with that with with uh, just the blowing to begin with I feel that motion of the air I'm connecting that air without the tongue and then as and then so on and then with your favorite HU the one that you brought yesterday Practice it with increasing difficulty by altering the articulation, the rhythm, the tempo. So. And so on. So I've got all these options to make things a little bit more challenging. Valerie, do we have any questions in the chat? Anything we can help with at this point? I don't think so. It, look, it looks good. Okay. I hear someone with more uh, more noises in the background than what I've got, which is uh, which is always a novel uh, novel way to run a session. Okay. So we're all clear with this. This is our recap. This is where we're up to now. So now the question is. How do we connect the bridge? So we've got one side of the one side of our river is our technique, our basic fundamentals, putting things in place in a technical way. On the other side of the bridge, we've got performing in concerts, performing in auditions, um, presenting things under pressure. The connection of the bridge is how do we build those skills in the technical way and then bring them to musicality? And this is what we've been working on through our connection with the studies. So this is RuPaul's beautiful artwork. Oh, are we seeing that? Are we seeing, I'm not seeing that. We are seeing, now we're seeing that, right? Okay, cool. All right, so <clears throat> what we ask you to do today is to bring a lyrical uh, excerpt and a technical excerpt. So here are a couple of examples of lyrical Except lyrical pieces that we get to play in the repertoire as a horn player. I'm sure uh, for the other instruments out there, you guys have got uh, similar pieces in your repertoire. So that's just a small sample of what I would think of as, as being lyrical in terms of our um, in terms of our repertoire. Now, put in the chat. What are the skills that we implement when we are playing these lyrical? Please let us let us know in the chat, and we're gonna we're gonna see if your ideas line up with my ideas. Okay, Valerie, how are we going? Okay, 
let's have a look. Concept, great. What, how you, uh, sound is an important thing, yeah. Sound. Airflow, great. Musical ideas and phrasing. Phrasing, yeah. Soft dynamics is great. Breathing, articulations. Okay. Lots of really great ideas. So what do I think? Line, making a connection through the through the phrasing. Legato is obviously one of the one of the really important things when we're playing lyrical lyrical music. Phrasing, obviously control of the range. So if we're playing Mala One, which could be the low horn uh, solo or the low horn duet, uh, starting on the pedal B flat, obviously that's a low range. And then and then there's uh, a lot of higher range stuff in there. We're playing the Pavan, so it's quite high. And then control of our air. Okay, so these things are really important for us to be aware of because what we realize is that we don't need to practice every excerpt over and over and over a thousand times in order to be building up the skill set that we need to perform that piece. If you look at the skills that we're using, line, legato, phrasing, range, air control, that pretty much would apply to all of those excerpts that are above there. So if you can find exercises and studies that will enhance those features, you're effectively practicing all of those excerpts at the same time. So the broader our skill set gets, we're going to talk about this tomorrow in, in terms of expanding the circle. But the broader our skill set gets, the more things that will fall within that skill set and that we're going to be able to do. So if you can play with great line, great legato, terrific phrasing, and you have a great range and you have good control of your air, there is going to be nothing in that group of etudes that's going to be a problem for you. Does that make sense? Really, really simple. So what I'm thinking of doing when I'm when I'm making this connection of the bridge is I want to find or create studies that are going to increase my skill set when I'm practicing. And if I can increase my skill set, then it's going to make life much easier when I apply that skill set to the excerpts. As a separate thing, I want to be making sure that I'm really aware of what is the musical approach that I want to these excerpts. Because obviously how I play Midsummer Night's Dream is going to be different than how I play Mala One. But the skills are going to be very similar. So we want to make sure when we're building our skill set that we're trying to apply the fundamentals to each of these things. Valerie, what have we got? Good ideas. Flowing air, tone consistency, listening to sound, concept of musical line. Terrific. So I wanted to um, I wanted to give you guys like a little uh, example. I'm just going to try and find it here. Give me two seconds. So if we take if we take let's say a simple cling etude. If I can find the right cling etude, I can do this. Okay, cling eleven. So a simple cling etude, I can I can use the cling etude to develop this lyrical plane. <laughs> that I'm using for that, let's have a listen and see if, if you can recognize any of this. Similar skills or not? Pretty much. 
much exactly the same. So, okay, so that's great. Well, why don't I just practice Beethoven eight and then not worry about clicking? Well, <laughs> Whoops, if I played the right notes, it'd be good. But you can see, for, so for Mendelssohn three, has the same skill set. So I can apply this study with, with Kling and I can expand my skill set and then apply that skill set to the to the excerpts that I want to want to be presenting. Does that make sense? Dale Clevenger has written play with a metronome. Very important. I don't know whether you, I don't know whether you're telling me Dale that I need to play with a metronome. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> That's probably true. But uh, I, I think the, the great thing about playing with a metronome is it, what, what we need to remember. And this is a really terrific point that it's important that we don't use the metronome as the thing that holds us in time. We're using the metronome as something that we can embed in ourselves so that we're building our internal meter to make sure that it lines up. So one of the, one of the if you're having trouble playing something in time, a good, a good idea for that one is to play something with a metronome. Absolutely, make sure that you, you can really line up with the metronome, but really focus on embedding that metronome in, into you. So if you're playing something that's in 4-4, a really great way to make sure that you're really solid, and they do this in the studios a lot, is to subdivide that. So you can put on a metronome of eight note, eighth notes so that you're really going to be locking into that, that rhythm. Once you're stable and you feel as though you're comfortable with the eighth note click or the eighth note metronome beat, then you can move that to quarter notes. And when you feel as though those quarter notes, uh, you're, you're embedding that and that's pretty solid, then move it to half notes. Then move it to one beat per bar and still feel as though if you can hit those bar lines in time, then your internal meter is starting to really be developed. And you can expand this to two bars. You have one beat every two bars. And you've got to make sure your internal metronome connects you so that you are hitting those bar lines on the spot. So that we're not using a metronome as a, as a crutch for us to make sure that it tells us what's in time, but it's a learning tool for us to make sure that we're embedding this rhythm into, into ourselves. Okay. So technical etudes, uh, sorry, technical excerpts. So there are a bunch that are pretty challenging for us as horn players and for most musicians. I'd say Barbara Seville for an oboe player and a clarinet player is also one of the ones that's fun to play. So what are the skills that we need for technical etudes? Whoops, I cheated. Okay, put it in the chat now that you've seen the answers. Valerie, what have we got? Strong articulations, coordination, flexibility, coordination of valves. Fantastic. Okay. So as we just saw, and these are obviously just some ideas, right? So you, what you want to do is when you get to your, when you get to a group of um, excerpts, for, for example, for an audition list, write down three to five elements that are actually in those excerpts. What you'll find pretty quickly is that you've got a bunch of similar things that keep coming up. You need good rhythm, you need good articulation, you need variety of articulation, you need range of dynamic, you need flexibility. All of these things. And then you can start thinking about, okay, so I can group certain excerpts together. And if I find a, find a study or a skill uh, 
exercise to expand that skill, then when I come back to these excerpts, each one of them is going to get better. So that we don't have to spend time practicing every single excerpt a thousand times over and over to get better. We're actually using studies and our, and our skill exercises to improve our overall level. So for this one, uh, for basically, if we take, let's say, Barbara Seville and Tillonenspiegel, Koprash number 17 is a good one for this. <laughs> We've got flexibility. We've got the arpeggios that we that we use throughout these exercises. We've got ascending and descending, focusing on the articulation. So when I'm practicing these, I would make sure that I started with the fundamentals that I want to put in place. So we would go back to breathing and blowing. And then apply as we did with the with the session yesterday. And then add the articulation. So that we have that we can we can gradually build up that skill set and I can go faster, I can go with different tempo, I can go with different uh, rhythms, I can go with different articulations to make things more difficult. And then when we apply it to So then I'm in good shape. And it's the same with so that I can apply the same skill set that I learned on that on that study to the excerpts. Okay. So the focus is on making sure that I'm applying the skill set that I've developed at one side of my I river across the bridge, and then I'm using the studies and my exercises to build this bridge and create more musicality as I head towards the pieces and excerpts that I want to play. Okay. So getting the practice tool. So this, I wanted to give you an idea of like how I break down after I've used those, the studies to build up my skill set and apply them to different things, how I would actually approach individual excerpts. Because you know, this is something at some point we're going to actually have to practice the excerpts and we need to make sure that we're um, that we're pretty clear about you know how they go and how we want them to sound. So let's take so breathing space is one that we that really is an important one that comes up for us. Who who struggles with taking fast breaths in the middle of the phrase? Anyone have problems with that? It's one of the biggest problems, other than us missing the first note, taking a quick breath in the middle of the phrase and getting back in and starting the next note is where most people are going to make their mistakes. Is that fair to say? I think so. I think so, yeah. So, so let's take, um, let's take Tchaikovsky 5. Tchaikovsky 5 is a good one. For us, because it's going to be able to show us several of these uh, little practice tools. So Tchaikovsky 5, in terms of breathing, and this applies to everything that you're going to, that you're going to face when you're playing uh, excerpts or pieces. So... <laughs> This is the first danger point, right? So I take a breath here. If I take a breath in a tense way, what happens to this crescendo? I have to, in order to 
made that crescendo, I have to push through tension and the sound is not very beautiful. We want this sound to just feel as though it's opening and staying beautiful and relaxed and a rich sound. The only way I can do that is if I take a, big, a good breath. If I'm feeling rushed and I haven't set up that mechanism well, it's going to be a tense breath. It's going to be shallow. It's going to be high, right? And I'm going to put tension in my throat. So how do I work on this? It's actually really easy because what I want to do is remember in my practice, it's all about enforcing and reinforcing good habits and keeping things really simple. So all I'm going to do is add a beat. control right because why because i've got a good set of lungs full right and there's no need for me to be in a hurry so i'm focusing on making sure that the quality of my breath is really really good everything is really really simple and i'm giving a really good repetition if i practice tchaikovsky five and most of us have practiced this quite a lot every time i take if every time i take a breath it's a shallow high tight breath i'm creating that as my habit when I get under pressure and I'm in a concert or if I'm playing that for an audition, that habit will come through. My brain will go to whatever the, the thing that I've repeated the most is. And your brain doesn't understand the difference between fast and slow. It just needs, it just, it will just go to whatever it is the most familiar with. So if we slow that down and make sure that every repetition is really good quality, then we're going to be in good shape. So the next iteration, I'm just going to slightly shrink that gap. And so on. Until I get to the point where I can still be really aware of how I'm breathing, even when I'm playing in tempo. is exactly the same i'm just shrinking the amount of time and this applies to everything that we do so when you're practicing a study that requires you to breathe in the middle build in time it is more important that you breathe well and that your your breath is relaxed and good quality and you can move the air than play it perfectly in time when you're practicing once you've established that habit and you can stay aware of it then you can shrink the gap and focus on playing it really rhythmically and Dale is absolutely right when he says we should play through the first movement before playing the solo. If you're, if you're intending on playing the solo with an orchestra at any time, you have to play through the first movement before you get to this because it is a totally different world of pain after you've played the first movement and then getting to this solo than just rocking up nice and fresh and being able to play this beautiful, soft, controlled way of doing things. So putting ourselves in, in sort of in a, a real-life situation is really important when we're preparing for, for auditions. Okay. So this is another really good one for us to use when we're talking about lyrical playing. And this is going to sound a little bit weird to you guys, but I guarantee you when you try it, you're going to be, you're going to be glad that I told you. So what I think of, if I'm having trouble, so one of the things that we talked about in lyrical playing is line, right? And connection of the sound. But what we hear a lot of people do because we're focused on getting the notes and because our articulation may not be perfect is we hear stuff like this. Anyone 
recognize that sound? Hopefully not from me too often. Right, but this, this often happens because we get that tongue to prepare the note and we're focusing on making sure we're getting the fronts of notes. It doesn't make for a really nice line. You can hear how it's not beautifully connected and, and it's not very musical. So how do we fix this? Well, there are a couple of ways. One, we can take the tongue completely out. But I find a really, really easy way of doing this. And flute players and oboe players and bassoon players don't have this problem. And string players don't have this problem because they use this all the time. But to add a really thick, wide, pretty dodgy vibrato. What the vibrato does is it makes us hear all the way through each note and connect those notes together. So listen to this. This is not how I play in the orchestra, by the way. So what do I feel out of that? Well, what I feel is I get through a lot more air and my air is supporting a lot more because I've got this great big wobble in between, right? So if I focus on them using the same air, the same spinning of the air, but I take the vibra vibrato out, so I have the same activity in the sound, the same spin through the line. <laughs> get through this phrase in much easier way because I'm actually I've got my air, air set up really well but I'm really connecting in between the notes so this is a good one to to practice really for anything if you if you if you have uh, issues with your legato playing with really thick vibrato and making sure that everything's super connected is going to really help that any questions Valerie yeah there was a question um would flutter tonguing work in the same way Oh, what a great question. So flutter tonguing is something that I tend to use. This works perfectly in this scenario, but it also works in faster pieces. So what one thing that I would do in order to make sure that one, I'm rhythmical when I'm playing my, my uh, lyrical uh, etudes and pieces is focusing on subdivision. We're gonna get to flutter tonguing in two, in two seconds, but it's a fantastic question. So with subdivision, what I want to think of, and Tchaikovsky 5 is a perfect excerpt for this because the problem with Tchaikovsky 5 is normally conductors will follow the horn player and the horn player will follow the conductor and the conductor will follow the horn player and the horn player will follow the conductor and the whole thing gets slower and slower and slower until it stops. This is a pretty regular thing until you work out that actually you need to be very responsible for the rhythm and that the conductor will follow you. So one way, and in auditions you hear this too, one way with lyrical stuff, because the big beats are so far apart in many cases, if we don't subdivide, we end up with a really wishy-washy rhythm. And this is what Dale's talking about with, with making sure you're playing with the metronome, is it's really important that you play within that framework. So it also helps us with subdivision to make sure that we're connecting the lines. So, the way that I would practice something like Tchaikovsky 5 in terms of subdivision was I, I would actually play the subdivision. five is this particularly relevant when we get to the animando because if we animando in the large beat we're going to get way too fast too soon and if we then slow down in the large beat we're going to get way too slow too soon 
But if we subdivide and play this really, really evenly with the Anamundo within the small notes, fits within the overall tempo and the architecture stays nice and stable. Then from there, I can just take that subdivision out of my articulation and put it in my head and I'm gonna be in good shape. So this is the same with everything else. It also helps with if we're playing something, for example, the one that I messed up before. <laughs> So that I'm really making sure that I've, I'm hearing all of the connection, all of the stability uh, through the rhythm, and then I can take the tongue out. of the rhythm and the line and it gives me really good structure. So flutter tonguing is our next practice tool that I would use and the, and the really good one for this is for me is technique based things uh, because what it does is it makes me focus on on connection with the airstream rather than focusing on all the little notes that go on. So a good example to try with this one is Barbara Seville. I have trouble at the bottom of the stave and just below the bottom of the stave. Many horn players have, have issues with breaks around the middle C. I have a little sort of a, not a break, but let's say it's um, a little bit broken. Well, not broken, but bent. I'm not really sure how you describe it. Um, but it's not quite great. My, my big break is at the pedal C uh, down, down an octave. But um, I have a little weak area down here. So if we go to the, and all of these excerpts are in the, in the uh, should be in the chat and in the uh, iron community. So if I take the first solo from, uh, from Barbara Seville and I add flutter tongue to this. I stay really stable in my corners. I'm really making sure that the air is moving me through the range and I feel very connected to the airstream. From there, I can take the flutter out. And then add the articulation. And I'm in good shape. The same thing will go for the solo. So I'm creating this architecture without the interruption of my articulation, because in this one, there's a lot of articulation when it comes to, uh, to Barbara Seville, this solo, there's a lot of articulation within the rhythm, and there's a lot of variety of articulation. Even within four bars, I've got mezzo staccato, I've got slurring and legato, and I've got this staccato dotted rhythm. So if I take this structure of my air and this structure of the line, and then I just add the airstream, uh, add the tongue to this. <laughs> So I have the air as my basis, and then I'm adding the other elements to that. But flutter tongue is a really excellent way of making sure that I'm connecting the airstream and I'm feeling how much work that goes on. When we when we put in a flutter tongue, 
where you're putting in through much, much more air into the instrument because we've got this big impediment in the rope. When we take that impediment out of the way by not fluttering, focus on using the same support, using the same flow of air, and things will be really, really stable for you. So this is another one. Huffing is one that, uh, that is really useful for us to focus on when we're thinking about articulation. Huffing is very a very good one for when we're playing accents. So we're creating the accents from, from our stomach, not from our tongue. But for those of you guys who've, who've been to the warm-up classes, we've done quite a little bit of huffing uh, over the journey. Uh, just, to, just as a recap for everyone. So if you take your mouthpiece or take your fingers, and what we're going to do is we're just going to blow and feel as though we're bouncing on a Pilates ball with your stomach. So feeling is really bouncy. The airstream goes straight. You can do this through a straw as well. As if someone is maybe jabbing you in the stomach. Also the feeling of laughing <laughs> is the same feeling that we get. And we want to make sure that, this, that we're able to do this. If we can't do this, it generally will mean that we're stuck in our diaphragm area. We're stuck in our stomach. That's not going to help us. It's going to send tension into your chest, tension into your throat, and block the airstream. So the more flexible we can be in our stomach area and the more we can think about articulation coming from there, the more chance we've got of having a sound open and actually being able to move the air how we want to. So... So that we're really conscious that this is flexible and active, not stuck. If you, if you squeeze your stomach muscles and then try and huff, you feel straight away that this will engage. And that's not what we want. So we can apply this to the horn or the, whatever instrument you like. It's really, really simple. Try it for yourself. Once you've tried it through the mouthpiece, put it to the horn, always remembering, making sure that the breathing is the same and the blowing is nice and free and it's just nice and flexible into the instrument. Looks good. Terrific. Okay. So how do we apply this? Well, when we're playing something like uh, Strauss one, it's pretty easy. So these are all accented and this is coming from here. And then I just coordinate my tongue with the same thing. Remembering we're going for simple, natural and repeatable. So my tongue position, my tongue movement is exactly the same. I'm just using the big muscles down here in my stomach to move the air faster at that point of the accent. I don't want to be creating the accent with my tongue because I'm going to end up with more harsh sound and I'm potentially going to put tension into my throat. So I can practice this one without articulation. And you can hear the accent as well as the sustaining connection of the line. From here, all I need to do is have my tongue coordinate with the start of that note. And I'm nice and flexible in my stomach area. So how do we apply this to something like, I don't know, Barbara of Seville, for, for example. So Barbara of Seville, at the beginning, we can just think of the, these articulations as little bounces. We're not going to make a huge movement. It's a mini movement, but we're keeping the flexibility there. So I would practice this one totally legato. <laughs> And then I would add a little tiny bounce. And then we can add the articulation. And we end up with this lovely clarity. And I can go shorter if I wanted to. I can go longer if I want to, because I've got the control and the flexibility of my air strength. So there's, some, there's another example of this, the Till Eulenspiegel. Till Eulenspiegel is another good one for us to, uh, to look at when it comes to articulation and flexibility with our air strength. Who has, anyone have trouble with Till Eulenspiegel? Any issues with Till Eulenspiegel? All a piece of cake, right? No worries. It is for Dale, but for the rest of us, it's pretty challenging. Yeah, so, so the 
the problem that I find with Till Oil and Spiegel is that we focus so much on these staccatos that we forget to blow. So what we end up with is so that we so that we're we're lo so locked up with the with playing these piano staccatos that when we make a crescendo we have to just the only thing we can do is just force through that tension and then hope that the notes come in and sort of just like throw as much mud as we can at the wall if we stay flexible in our airstream and connected to the line then all it is is just opening up the sound as we make this crescendo and we, and we open up the character. The more natural we are with our body, the more chance we've got of playing things musically because we've got less things in the way. We're just going to blow the image that we have in our head. We're going to talk about this a lot tomorrow. So to Lon and Spiegel, really, really simple. What I want to do is create the architecture of the line. <laughs> So there's my overall shape. Once I've got the overall shape, now I can start carving out some of the detail. So what I want to do is actually now make sure that I'm flexible in my stomach because that's what I'm going to need to make these staccatos. So there I've got the flexibility connected with the line. What's next? I just add the tongue. And now I'm in a position where I've gone from this timid character at the beginning where he's not quite sure about, you know, how funny he is to now I'm open and I'm ready to play the second phrase where I'm fully confident and know that everyone loves me. And I'm in good shape. And the conductor's happy. And I'm less stressed because I've then got the hardest bit of the piece out of the way. So this is how we want to approach thinking about bringing things from our fundamentals to something like Till Eulenspiegel. We want to start with the simplest thing. How am I breathing? How am I blowing? And then applying that as a basis to everything. When we're building up excerpts, we don't need to put all the elements in place to begin with. We want to set the basic structure, basic architecture, and then start adding in more difficult things. So we start with two longitude. The other way that we can start it, of course, is through the mouthpiece. So I'm feeling what my tongue's doing. I'm feeling that coordinating with my airstream. I don't have the stress of having to play all these notes. I want to set up that mechanism, be aware of the feeling. Then I can apply that feeling onto the horn and things are really simple. So that we have all of these tools to construct the technique of our excerpts. And that's going to free up our musical picture so that we are going to be able to produce really nice results under pressure. So our assignment for today. Choose a technical excerpt. It can be to launch regal if you want. That'd be great. And choose one of the practice tools that we talked about. So as a reminder, creating space in, space in your breathing, vibrato, subdivision, flutter tongue, or huffing. Choose one of those. And use the tool three times a day as you practice that excerpt. If you want to use all of the tools, great. Add them in as well, but be conscious of which one you're actually putting in place. But see if you can apply that to an excerpt that you feel comfortable with, but is not exactly how you want it to go. Do we all have an excerpt like that? All have one of those excerpts like, yeah, I think I know how it goes, but it's never quite right. Think about what is, what is the best practice tool to start with to help you on your way of getting to that great performance level. Okay.
But tomorrow we're going to we're going to really focus on the musical side of things and how we can ingrain the musical side into our excerpts and pieces and how we can perform better on stage. We're going to do a little bit of talk on mental, uh, my mental state when I'm when I'm playing, how I approach uh, excerpts and pieces from a mental point of view, and how can I bring the best possible image to performance in my mind. Rupal, any questions? Oh, well, there's just um, so if you put the assignment back up, so you're going to choose one practice tool to to practice in your practice sessions. But Andrew really wanted you to choose three. We just we're trying to you know take it in steps here. So if, the bonus is if you can actually choose if you want to go back one slide, Andrew. If you can choose, you know, one or more of these tools to focus on in those practice sessions. And the important thing is one at a time, we're building layers. It's exactly the same with our fundamental technique development. We want to make sure that we're focusing on one thing at a time. When we're happy with how that works, then move on to the next thing. So we're building these layers. So don't try and do all three at once. Do one at one, one, one time, make sure that you do that and feel as though you're building confidence with that and it's really helping and then add the next step. Great. Hope you guys are having fun. We are... Uh... We're enjoying doing this with you and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Right. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.